Welcome to The Mastering Show. This is the show where we talk about all aspects of mastering. I'm Steve Cherubino, just one of your hosts, and joining me, my co-host, the man who brings the knowledge to the show, the master of mastering himself, Ian Shepard. What's up, Ian? I'm good. Well, actually, this this is a big deal this week, right? Because this is your final week as my co-host on The Mastering Show. This is. This is a bit of a sad week. Tough one to swallow. Yeah, it is. Because Steve was, I mean, as everybody knows, who was listening to this podcast from the beginning, and if you haven't listened to it from the beginning, I highly recommend that you do. Uh, Steve was the guy who persuaded me to do this show. Without Steve, there literally wouldn't be a mastering show. There would still be the idea for a mastering show in my head, but it would probably still be like number 10 on my to-do list. And Steve came forward, he had the idea for the EDMMR network, and he wanted to do a mastering show as part of that, and he asked me to co-host it with him. And it just seemed like a great opportunity, like a win-win scenario. And, you know, based on the response we've had to the show, I think everyone would agree it's been a success. So I want to say thank you, Steve, for persuading me to do it in the first place, for being such a great co-host. And I know that you've been insanely busy with your new uh, project for the last at least month, if not six weeks. So I want to say thanks for hanging in there and carrying on being the co-host while I figured out what I was going to do next. (laughs) And for anybody listening, the answer to what I'm going to do next is the show is going to continue. I'm planning to have a few co-hosts over the next few weeks. Um, Some guests I think would be fun and you guys would enjoy hearing from. Um, And then we'll see what happens. But uh, yeah, thank you, Steve. It's appreciated. Well, thank you, Ian, for carrying this on. Um, Yeah, we get great response from the show and I'm happy to see it continue. I'm sad to leave. I don't plan on leaving podcasting forever. But um, it was a good opportunity. I got a job at a marketing company, company learning all about Google ads and Facebook ads and stuff that's really going to help in the future when I do come back to it. So uh, it's been a really exciting time. Lots of challenges, but a lot of fun. And um, yeah, so that's what's been going on with me. And uh, thanks, Ian, for continuing. No, my pleasure. Thank you. All right. So you must want to know what this week's topic is going to be, right? Yeah, and I'm wondering if you know what this week's topic is going to be. I do. Uh, This week's topic is distortion. Ah, sweet. I have an unopened copy of Ohm Force sitting on my shelf that I got at Guitar Center for like five bucks. And I have a feeling after the show I might open it. But go ahead. That's, uh, I love those plugins. That's, um, Ohm Aside. That's five, five bucks. That's a, that's a, it was one of the deals or one of the methods I, I I talked about in one of my EDM shows. You go to Guitar Center. And they might not have it anymore, but they're like clearing out all... They they actually have a lot of plugins there. They're in DVD cases from like Sugar Bites and UVI and Ohm Force. And they're kind of like off to the side. But if you spot them, you'll realize they're not DVDs. They're just plugins that they're just like basically blowing out of the store. And I'll probably get them for like five, 10 bucks. Good stuff. So if you are near a guitar center, look for the DVD cases in the recording section and you'll see what I'm talking about. Uh, yeah. Good nice. tip. Nice. So based on what you know about me and the things we've talked about over, this is show 14, the last 14 weeks plus, what do you think I think about distortion? I think you think distortion has its uses, but is generally overused and, you know, has its, has its benefits, but is probably, I don't know. That's all I have to say about it. Well, no, no you, you're absolutely right. And the because the reason I ask it is because actually I think lots of people think that I hate distortion. That I, because, you know, a, a lot of the time I'm talking on my blog, I'm complaining about records that are unnecessarily distorted, that right. are distorted too much. We had the vinyl show last week where I was talking about the fact that I don't like the distortion that you get as you move through a side of, you know, the the piece of vinyl. And um, also, you know, people talk using like console shaper plugins and like way cranking them up way too high. and yeah. Exactly. All, all that stuff. Um, and... One of the reasons for this show is just to to kind of redress the balance a bit and say, you know, actually, I love distortion. You were a heavy metal um, guy, weren't you? Well, I, yeah, I was into my hair metal in my youth, um, and I'm a big, I don't know about EDM, but I'm a big electronica 
fan. So I love it. So, I mean, just for example, one of the songs I always think of is a classic track uh, by the band Underworld called Rez, um, which was turned into Cowgirl on their first album. I don't know whether you, you know it, but it's got this amazing synth lead sound that is just kind of, you know, it builds through the whole track. It's it's the melody line, it's the hook, it's everything about the tune. Um, and I didn't realise until I heard their live DVD, Everything Everything, how that sound is constructed. Because in that version of the song, right at the end, they basically the sound starts to change. It starts to become less and less distorted. The harmonics start dropping out of it. And eventually it kind of turns into this almost like a sine wave, almost this pure tone. And that was this kind of moment of clarity for me where I realized that the sound I'd been listening to was pure distortion. <laughs> you know, I mean, it was it was beautiful kind of harmonic. I don't know how they did it. I don't know whether it was a filter within the synth or whether they ran it through some external piece of kit. But, you know, the whole song would have been nothing without distortion. It was just kind of built out of distortion. So, I mean, there's one example that I love. Um, another one kind of uh, is, I mean, I'm a huge fan of Imogen Heap. I think I might have mentioned that before. Her song, Hide and Seek, features her singing through effectively a vocoder. Um, and she's kind of playing a keyboard line. And the kind of the distortion of that kind of it's I don't know whether it's a harmonizer or what kind of effect it is but just again it's this beautiful soft kind of subtle and then at some points it's so distorted that you can barely tell that it's a human voice singing anymore um Goldfrap do the same thing on their first album Felt Mountain there's several times there where Alison Goldfrap the lead singer I mean she can she can sing with a beautiful pop voice but she can also sing almost like an opera singer. Ah. Um, and they do this thing where they have a theremin, you know, the the kind of the instrument that you don't even touch. It's like a yeah. wire where you have a ring on the hand and it kind of makes this kind of sine wavey sound. So there are points in that where you'll be listening to a theremin and it'll kind of blur into distortion and then it'll kind of blur out and you'll think you're listening to her singing and then it'll kind of morph back again. It's this amazing thing where, you know, you it's kind of half human, half machine. Huh. Um, and then there's just a ton of kind of, balls out rock uh you know just running out of words <laughs> uh riff fests you know i mean everybody loves a bit of distorted electric guitar sure. you know um or there's something like exterminator the primal scream record has some songs on it that are just absurdly distorted i mean they kind of they're so distorted they make me laugh out loud that you know you think death magnetic's distorted you haven't heard anything so yeah as a as a creative tool, I love distortion just as much as the next person. It's you're right. It's that kind of unnecessary distortion that, um, or not un unnecessary, but that kind of just blanket distortion of everything. You yeah. know, taking an otherwise sort of normal sounding album and just adding distortion to it all the way through makes no sense to me, really. I mean, do you? So you're you've got that Ohm Force plugin waiting for you to to play with. What other kind of distortion effects do you like to use when you're working on your music? I use all kinds. Um, bit crushers that, you know, either come with the DAW or third party. I like third party distortions, um, saturation plugins, like uh, uh, guitar simulators. I mm -hmm. love using yep. them on like, amp simulators. On like synth leads, like um, guitar rig, amplitude, a couple other ones. Persona Studio One comes with one called Ampire, which is decent. Um, I love just using different distortions and throwing them mainly on like lead or like an arpeggio effect and, you know, giving it a little bit of grit just to make it stand out a little bit, just give it a little bit of character. It it takes your song from sounding like you made it on a computer to actually being a song. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, that's interesting, isn't it? And I, I think actually that's that's an aspect of it that is true in mastering as well. So... um. What I thought might be interesting in this is just to go through a few different types of distortion, kind of from a mastering perspective, because all of that stuff that we've just been talking about is kind of creative distortion used in the mix. You know, I mean, uh, the Beatles didn't invent distortion, but the guitar sound in Revolution is one of the most famous examples of where they just plugged an electric guitar directly into the, the mixing console at Abbey Road and cranked that up to get this incredible kind of 
gritty, fizzy, raspy, distorted yeah. guitar sound. And uh, the technicians in their white coats were kind of horrified about this and tried to put a stop to it, you know. But by that stage, in this was by the White Album, so in this stage in their career, they pretty much could get away with whatever they wow. wanted. It's an um, interesting story. Well, and even, I mean, even electric guitar, you know, amp distortion. Um, I think legend has it, it was uh, Clapton and uh, John Mayall and the Bruise Breakers album is the kind of the first known version of somebody, you know, pushing a, a Les Paul through a Marshall amp to get that kind of overdriven sound that is just, most of our music is built on right. this or, you know, right. in, in the rock Absolutely. area is, is built right. on. Um, but yeah, so those are all kind of creative and artistic ways of using it in the composition and the mixing process. And I think when you get to mastering, it's different because my default position is actually it's my job not to add any distortion. That's not to say that I don't ever add any distortion, but I kind of feel like, you know, who am I to say, oh, you should have distorted this record. Exactly. I, I, uh, I see how you have that viewpoint. Yeah. I mean, one of the interesting things about distortion, people do talk about distortion and they think of those kind of blatant things that we've been talking about. But I think it's important to to realize that from a technical point of view, any change to an input signal is a distortion. Okay, so because if you want 0% distortion in a signal chain, you basically want the output to be exactly the same as the input. So any kind of change is technically a distortion, even a tiny level difference okay. is a distortion because it's a change in the signal, right? You're just using, you know, in like the truest sense of the word, you mean like you're distorting the signal? In the purest sense yeah. of the word, yeah. Now, you, you, I think most people would agree that uh, a small gain change is probably harmless distortion. Um, it's not if you think back to, well, it kind of leads me to the next kind of distortion, which is extra hiss. I mean, that's another really benign type of distortion. You know, I often say to people who are obsessing about hiss, I think I mentioned it before, that, you know, hiss is your friend, that some of the, the best recordings ever are covered in hiss. Nobody cares. But actually, back in the day, tracking to analog tape, you know, if you're recording a quiet instrument and the signal level is too low so that you're down near the noise floor and you get a, a small signal change and reduction of level, you're reducing the signal to noise ratio. So when you turn that element back up in the mix you're going to hear more hiss than you wanted and then you might start to perceive that hiss as distortion hmm. um you know mentioning the beatles again back in the day they had four track recorders they would record on all four tracks of a tape then they would bounce that down to one track of a new tape and they'd overdub on the next three tracks and then they would over they would bounce that down to another tape all on one channel when you do that enough times the noise floor becomes a genuine concern. You know, there was a there was a physical limit to the number of times they could perform that process right. without degrading the signal. And at that point, you know, clearly, I think you would say that it's a distortion. Um, even something like stereo width alterations, which we've talked about before in an earlier episode as, as a creative part of the, the mastering engineer's palette, uh, in a strict sense, is distortion because it is... A change of the signal and again if you i mean there's an interesting trend there which is that all of these things start to be more uh understandable calling them distortions when you think that they uh they cause damage of some kind to the signal so if you think about right. some beautiful stereo 3d image that you've got and then for whatever reason that gets panned in slightly you're going to lose some of that stereo image separation you know, you're going to get a little bit of cancellation happening. You might have some kind of some unwanted side effects of that. And at that point, it goes from being a creative effect to being a distortion. So those are kind of three examples of distortions that often are not thought of as distortions. All right. I didn't think of them like that. There you go. Um, then there's another category of distortion where I would say it's the kind of thing we've been talking about. People use them deliberately because they like them. Um you know, uh, analog valve distortion, overdriving valve or tube gear. Um, that's we've been doing that since the '60s. Everybody loves it. Uh, peak saturation, analog tape saturation. We've talked about those in previous episodes. Those are uh, distortions that have uh, that are a flavour that lots of people really like, and that can be musically useful. Um, 
I mean, compression pumping, the effect of a compressor working or a limiter working, even if it's clean, even if it's not kind of causing blatant distortion. Again, those are changes to the in input signal. Those are technically distortions and, and, you know, people use them every day creatively to, to achieve the sound that they're looking for. So I would never call them distortions. It's interesting that you, you know, showing it to us in this light. Yeah, well, that's that's what that's kind of why I wanted to approach it from this angle, just to kind of exactly to reflect that perspective. You know, to, when you're thinking about it from a mastering standpoint, you need to think about these things differently. And I guess it's worth knowing that, you know, there's a downside as a mastering engineer, you could use any of these effects creatively to, to bring something to a production that it might not have had before. But, you know, it's very much you, you're kind of looking at the costs and the benefits. Um, you know, if I use some gentle tube saturation, um, you know, in the EQ on this song, it gives me that kind of that fuller kind of more glued together sound. It's a little bit of that analog warmth that, you know, we've mentioned before. But it is also going to add some distortion. It's going to increase the noise, all of those kinds of things. You've got to be—I think—you have to be much more uh, aware of the the downsides of all of these processes when you're mastering, because you know, because if you're if you're mixing or recording and, and it's a creative process, it, you know, if if it ends up covered in hiss and you like it, well, that's your decision, right? It's you know, nobody's going right. to tell you that that's wrong. It's just part of the palette of sound that you have available to you. People might like it, people might hate it, but if that's what you want to do. But if you're a mastering engineer, then that's different. And I think even if people are mastering their own gear, it's worth... Mastering their own songs? Yeah, mastering their own songs. Or, um, uh, you know, maybe they don't call themselves a mastering engineer, that, but they're doing something, a quotes mastering job for, for somebody else. Again, it's a mindset issue, right? Way back to, to show number one. I think thinking about these things in a different way. It's easy as if you're a recording and mixing engineer to get to get used to just kind of spreading these effects all over everything and not worrying about it. And I think we need to be to have a more kind of analytical approach to it when you're coming at it from the mastering process because, you know, again, if if you want that as a creative decision, why didn't you do it in the mix? That's right. I know what you mean. What thoughts do you have like when do you think a track needs something like that and what do you use well there's an interesting example in the the home mastering masterclass course that i run i forget which week it is where it's uh, it's a metal band in fact and it's been tracked very clean uh, i mean it sounds great it's got loads of dynamics but actually for me it just sounds a little bit too clean a little bit too clinical so in that one i experiment with i think it was uh ozone that i was using in that um that week's video just to th th there's an exciter section in ozone which you have to be pretty careful with because it can get very messy very quickly right. um but they shouldn't call it an exciter it makes people want to turn it up well yeah i mean it's that kind of stuff is exciting but only in very small doses you know um mm, right. <laughs> the uh after that it pretty quickly gets tiresome but in this case i was able to get a result i really quite liked i've also experimented with the uh there's the waves kramer tape emulation i mean some mastering engineers will actually record stuff out to analog tape and back in um that's not i don't have an analog tape machine available to me these days um i mean i, I can hire them in if i need them for transferring sources across but well, I, you would I, probably not do that anyway i probably wouldn't do that anyway i kind of feel like that's i kind of feel like it's overkill um, I mean, if somebody specifically requested it, I'd be, that'd be fine. But um, sure. but yeah, you can, I mean, these days you can experiment with some of the plug-in alternatives and there are some hardware units out there that do stuff as well. I mean, the most extreme example I can think of was I did an album for Matt Johnson, who was in the band The The back in the 80s. Um, okay. And he did an album of film music. I don't think this album ever got released um, it was a pretty interesting project. It was we edited it together. I mean, there must have been like twenty or thirty snippets of film music that he'd done over the years, edited into this continuous seventy-minute sequence. And there was one point where he just wanted something to be really, really distorted. And at that point, I didn't. He kind of sprung this on me, so I didn't have any suitable gear available to me in the studio, uh, except for an old Joe Meek compressor. Um, 
and but but it was mono. <laughs> So what okay. we what we ended up doing is because the obviously we're working from a computer it was ran the left hand side of the mix through this thing the first time and the right hand of the mix through the next time so we had two separate okay. passes um, so it's kind of like a, an unlinked stereo compressor and you um, just cranked the thing oh we just pushed it it was insane and actually I I called I mean he he was happy at the time I called him up the next day and said you know I think probably we we went over the top can we can I do you a slightly less crunched version. Um, and he uh, he agreed to that, so to actually took a step back. But yeah, I mean that's that's kind of the most damage I've ever deliberately done in a mastering <laughs> session. Um, but you know, Did you feel a little guilty. No, I actually enjoyed it. You know, it's because I mean I do I I love a good bit of distortion, and so I don't often get the chance to to do that kind of thing. Um, I quite commonly use. Uh, soft clipping um there's a the the mastering stuff in the tc electronic uh hardware has a soft clipping option you can you can soft clip on the input or you can soft clip on the output of the the processing there i use it very delicately but what is it exactly well i mean it's so a hard digital clipping is just where the waveform goes straight up to zero and gets the top chopped off yeah so yeah. you know if you imagine a sine wave if you boost that far enough, it'll end up eventually looking more like a square wave um, because the, right. the peaks and troughs of the, squ- the sine wave go so far above and below the zero points that it just gets the top and the bottom chopped off completely. That's an extreme example. A soft clipper would give you something similar, but it would basically, it starts to reduce. The, the, the thing about hard clipping is there's no gain reduction, there's no gain reduction, there's no gain reduction, and then suddenly everything gets removed, right? It just can't go any higher. With right. a soft clipping unit, you get to a point, and I mean, you can dial in a threshold on the TC gear um, and some of the other things as well. There's one in uh, T-Rex um, that springs to mind. There's a thing called G-Clip, which I haven't used because I think it's PC only. Um, but all of these things start reducing the gain as you get towards zero so that rather than the waveform being just squared off, you kind of round off the edges. Um, and... That's more along the lines of what happens if you push stuff hard into maybe a console or analog tape. Gotcha. The nice thing about clipping is that there's no gain reduction as such, right? If you use a limiter, it actually pulls the gain back. So you, if you, and if you push a limiter hard, you will hear the signal pumping. Yeah. Um, so it sounds clean, but it can sound soft. The nice thing about a soft clipper is that basically it just kind of stops at a certain point. Um, it's not that the gain is pulled back from where it was. It's just that it can't get any higher than a certain point. It can get a, have a more aggressive effect. I see. Sometimes I'll get stuff that comes in where it has very clean drums and I'm pushing the level up and the you know my ears are telling me it's loud enough. The meters are telling me it's loud enough and it doesn't feel loud enough. So... In those kind of cases, the, the gain control that I can have, the, the compression of the limiting might actually be too clean. So those are the kind of situations where I might experiment with a little bit of soft clipping. And I usually share it. I don't kind of do 100% soft clipping or 100% limiting in those cases. It's just a little bit of soft clipping to, to control things a bit before it hits the limiter. So the limiter doesn't have to work so hard. So you don't hear the gain reduction from the limiter so much. And the thing is, as you use the soft clipper, you are introducing distortion at that point. Um, right. And it's a question of balancing how much you get. You know, at what point is, you know, a little bit might be desirable, a little bit might be, and, and beyond a certain point, it'll be too much. And it's it's finding the balance point for that. Is it a plug-in or is it done at recording level? Well, I mean, you can achieve soft clipping or in a... Recording stage. Yeah, you you can achieve it in various different places. I mean, you can you can uh, overdrive a mic pre, and you'll get some kind of soft-ish clipping. I mean, it depends on the pre as to, you know analog gear. Right. It depends very much on the the design of it as to how it sounds. Um, you can clip the digital converters. I don't recommend it with prosumer converters, and I don't do it myself. But some engineers swear by soft clipping. Their converter so in that case it's kind of like an analog clipping stage i think before it hits the converter the the analog to digital stage so if you have some gear that has plenty of headroom then basically you're looking for gear that will um overload gracefully if you like gotcha. um whereas 
cheaper gear tends to, you know, it'll sound fine until the point where you overdrive it and then suddenly it'll sound horrendous. Um, <laughs> and again, sometimes as a creative effect, that can be fun, but usually in mastering, it's not what you're looking for. Right. You could clip plugins. You can have plugins that emulate clipping. Um, I'm using a hardware unit for the TC that I'm talking about, but that's, it's still a digital unit. So that's software running in a, you know, in a piece of outboard. So basically you can use it wherever you like. <laughs> It's the short answer to that question. <laughs> I got it. And it has a different it. effect, of course, at every stage. If you put a very dynamic signal into a clipper, it will mainly take off all the transients. So then you're putting in a, uh, a smoother signal into the compressor, which means that if you have short attack times, there's less work for the compressor to do. Um, whereas if you move that clipper to the end of the chain that really spiky waveform going in with a fast attack time on the compressor could cause lots of compression to happen in the compressor okay. and then maybe not leave as much work for the clipper to do at the end of the chain, um, but sound very different. It's huh. um, just like using EQ before or after a compressor can have a different effect. So another thing you, some people might do is if you're going to go out to some analog gear where maybe it doesn't distort that gracefully, or you just want to make sure you're not going to get too much of that saturation effect, you might even put a clipper on the output before you feed the stuff out to the analog gear in the chain and then bring it back in. You know, it's huh. these are the kind of subtleties where it's all about experience, knowing the gear that you have, the plugins that you have, figuring out what works, what doesn't, and there's a, a degree of taste involved. I mean, I think there's a degree of taste involved with all of this stuff, right? Because, I mean, we're adding distortion. And if you're doing it at the mastering stage, the only justification for doing that is if it sounds good. And whether or not it sounds good is subjective. Um, you know, Death Magnetic is a classic example where 20,000 Metallica fans thought that the distortion they used on that album didn't sound good. And presumably lots of other people did. Because, in fact, I just read a blog post by... Uh, Fab Dupont recently, where he was making that very point. He was basically comparing the Black Album with Death Magnetic um, and and making the point that this was a creative decision that they used on that album to achieve a specific sound. And he was arguing that that was valid and successful. I would say it was valid and not completely successful. Um, didn't the mastering engineer say that he didn't, it wasn't his, some of his best work? That's not really what he said. What I think what he was saying was that it it came to him already in a, pati uh, a particular state. So he didn't uh, want to be held responsible for the way it sounded. Now, what I'm not clear on is whether he he may still have... Because there's, there's digital clipping on that. The question is, where did it come into the chain? Right, because um, well, the Guitar Hero version doesn't have it. So they, they, they remixed it? Well, that was... Yeah, the Guitar Hero version was much earlier in the mixing stage. That was the whole thing. That that went literally went off to the guys who designed the game, I think, six, eight months before the final record went to mastering. Got so it. basically there were there are a ton of mixed decisions that were not incorporated into the stems that went out to to the makers of the game. That's so interesting. And that's yeah, that's what made it such a, a kind of a fascinating example. Um so I mean since we're talking about that, I guess we could round this off by talking about distortions that are almost always a bad thing in mastering um most people would call and to be honest there's there's not that many of them um one of them though would be heavy aliasing what's aliasing aliasing is the distortion you get where i mean you mentioned bit crusher plugins so mm -hmm. you know that sound you get with an 8-bit bit, bit crusher yeah. where it's kind of it's i don't know how to describe it it's kind of it's almost like as the sound goes up in pitch, you can hear another a copy of it kind of coming down in pitch um, yeah. over the top of it. Um, that's aliasing distortion. That's an extreme example of aliasing distortion. So if you take a 44.1 digital signal and feed it into a 22 kilohertz sampler without filtering out everything above 10 kilohertz, you will get aliasing distortion because what happens is that the any frequency content above half the sampling frequency of whatever you're using, it basically gets folded down. It gets mirrored back down oh. um, on top of everything else that's there. And, and because that's a kind of a purely mathematical thing, it's got nothing to do with music, chances are it will sound horrible. Right. Having said that, 
So yeah, one of my favourite albums ever is Apollo by Brian Eno with Daniel Lenoir and his brother Roger. Um, it's, well, they call it Atmospheres and Soundtracks. It's the soundtrack to a film, a fantastic film, or which, where they edit together loads and loads of footage of the moon landings. They take like all 13, 14, however many it was, missions to the moon, take all of that footage and edit it into one giant trip there and back. Um, and huh. it just has this beautiful kind of ambient soundscape behind it. Virtually no dialogue. Um, amazing film. Anyway, I've loved that since forever. And it was only when I put it on a year or two ago in my mastering room that I realized it's full of aliasing distortion. Um, really? I'm guessing 22 kilohertz from from early samplers or I don't know where it could have come in anywhere in the process. It's not extreme, but it's there and it's quite audible and it had never bothered me before. And even as I listen to it now, it's the kind of the technical part of my head is going, mm, aliasing distortion, but it still kind of sounds lovely and it, it adds to the atmosphere and the flavor of it. So, right. you know, there's another example of where something, I'm guessing that wasn't added in the mastering. I hope it wasn't added in the mastering though. Again, I hope it was a creative process. Right. Another kind of definitely bad in inverted commas, a type of distortion is excessive limiter or clipping distortion. Um, I kind of feel like we've done that one to death. We don't really have to go over the top. I mean, clearly, these days, many people are making the decision that lots and lots of uh, saturation, clipping, limiting distortion actually is desirable. You know, that's the loudness war sound. Um, right. And that's, you know, I mean, something we haven't touched on before. There's, there's me with my kind of mini crusade to try and persuade people not to do this as a, a matter of course, but there are lots of people who will come to a session and that's the sound that they're looking for. And the point where they get happy is where the mastering engineer pushes it that hard. So, you know, we do currently have a generation who are kind of addicted to that sound, some of them, right? Um, you know, which is, I find sad, but, you know, to some extent that's the, that's the sound of today. Right, it's true. And hard digital clipping um, is another kind of distortion that I don't really think. Small amounts of digital clipping can be very hard to hear, actually. Um, so I mean, there was one occasion where a guy wanted the level on an album lifted quite substantially, and he really didn't like the sound of the any of the limiters I was able to offer him. Um, and eventually I said, well, I said, the only other thing you've got is, is clipping, and that's going to be horrible. Listen. Um, and he listened to it, and on that material in that case we clipped it by 4 dbs um and he was happy with it and <laughs> and i wasn't you know i was kind of i was uncomfortable with it on a technical aspect but i had you couldn't argue that it sounded pretty good i couldn't argue well it didn't have any of the, the stuff that he didn't like about the limiters right he couldn't hear the gain right. reduction working all of that kind of stuff and the limiting was not that offensive um i mean what's the story morning glory by oasis that's often mentioned as an early loudness war example, most of the distortion on there is clipping distortion. Really? And in comparison to what happened on something like, say, Death Magnetic, in some ways it's less audible. You know, I mean, one of the other interesting things about Death Magnetic was that the distortion there was so audible, whereas in some respects, clipping distortion is is less noticeable. It's less blatant. Um, it's kind of equally nasty in different ways, and it does some fairly horrible things to the digital to analog converter at the end of the chain but yeah i mean there's another it's another case it's it's choices it's it's cost versus benefit um and in the case of that album the the artist decided that the the cost of a little bit of clipping distortion was outweighed by the benefit in terms of the the increase in level that was a long time ago i think i would work even harder to try and persuade him not to do it these days um we didn't have loudness normalization and streaming platforms back then and then so the final bit so what have we had we've had distortions that most people don't think of as distortions there's distortions that people think of as distortions but they like as part of the creative process there are distortions where too much is almost always a bad thing and then i would say there are some categories where there is some debate um so we talked about one of them last week uh, the sound of vinyl there are all kinds of distortions, you know, all that rumble, hiss, click, thumps, pops, crackle, all of that stuff is technically a distortion, but lots of people love the way that it sounds, including the, the type that I don't like, where it kind of gets worse towards the end of the side. 
This isn't a mastering process, but auto-tune is a form of distortion, but lots of people use it and feel it's beneficial. Lots of people love it, you know. There are some singers who choose to use it on everything they do. Right. So, you know, I think we have to agree that that's up for debate. Um, and then the final one is uh, truncation distortion, which is, without getting into too much detail, um, if people really want an episode of the podcast on dither, I guess I will do one one of these days. <laughs> but it's it's what happens if you don't use dither in a digital system. Dither is this very low-level noise. It's pretty much indistinguishable from white noise, from hiss. And it is required for a digital to analog converter to work effectively, to achieve the maximum signal-to-noise ratio and to avoid the alternative, which is truncation distortion. So it's basically, you know, in a 16-bit system, when you get down to the lowest bit, the converter is just making a decision. It's kind of saying, am I off or am I on? Um, and if you leave it to make those decisions without applying dither, it will distort the signal. A simple example of that is if you think about the decay at the end of a note, um, you know, okay, maybe a cymbal crash or something kind of tailing off into silence. At the end of it, you have this tiny little sound and it's so quiet that if it's crossing over the boundary where that last bit of the audio signal um, is having to make decisions, it will start to, you'll get a kind of a flutter or a stutter where it kind of it goes, oh, I'm off. No, I'm on. No, I'm off. And instead of a, a smooth decay, you kind of get a oh, I see. sound. Um, it also shows up in all kinds of other ways. If you put a sine wave into a system and put it in at a low level so that truncation distortion starts to happen, it stops being a sine wave and you get lots of extra... I mean, they're not really harmonics because harmonics are musically related to the original pitch. Um, and these are just extra spikes in the frequency spectrum. Again, a bit like aliasing distortion. They're very unnatural. They're very digital sounding. Um, so I find them pretty objectionable. How much you hear of them when the music is going full tilt depends very much. Sometimes you won't notice this kind of distortion at all. Um, but there are times when it's audible and the solution is simple, which is a tiny little bit of hiss way down at, you know, minus 90 dBs, so low that most people won't even hear it. And at 24-bit, it's even lower. It's like minus 144 dBs or something. I see. You put in the hiss. It doesn't remove the distortion. It changes where the energy of the distortion is, um, basically turns it into hiss. And that's the the kind of the root of the whole misconception about there being a flaw in the digital sound. You know, when people say to you, oh, you get extra resolution by getting 24 bits versus 16, that's the mistake there. If you use dither, as I talked about in an earlier episode, even an 8-bit signal will have a full resolution audio signal in there. It'll just have lots and lots of hiss. Huh. Um, at 16-bit, again, you've got this beautiful full resolution signal up to the frequency limit, um, and the hiss can be very, very quiet. I see. I've put this in the kind of the up for debate category, not because I think it's up for de debate. I'm very clear that truncation distortion is just a bad thing. I can't think of any reason you would ever choose it. Um, I always recommend people use dither because, you know, I mean, we're all questing after the analog sound, you know, analog warmth and all the rest of it. And if there are two types of distortion that are can in no way be called natural, you know, they just don't happen anywhere except in a digital system. It's aliasing distortion and truncation distortion. So to me, right. those are the two things that you absolutely have to eliminate. And that basically is down to good converter design. But it means, I mean, I'm, baffled as in this day and age as to why certain DAWs and audio processing packages and plugins don't include dither or even they include it and it's not on by default really uh, that uh okay i guess users can have the choice but i think you know somebody should be going into it with their eyes open going okay i'm deliberately turning off dither for some reason that i don't really understand right. but right. rather than having to know to go in and enable it that's the bit that's crazy to me. And again, I, I suspect that some of the issues people have with early digital gear are related to the fact that they didn't have proper anti-aliasing filters and they didn't use dither correctly. Huh. Um, no kidding. I think that might have contributed to the kind of the bad reputation of digital audio. Really? That's interesting. It reminds me, I attend a meetup called the Florida Podcasters Association in Tampa, 
And um, Roy, if you're listening, this story is for you. We had an audio engineer come in and talk to the people that attend the, the meetup. And mind you, they're usually not techie people at all. Okay. They're business people. So they don't know hardly anything about audio. And the slightest little thing when you get advanced will confuse them. Well, Roy comes in and does this presentation. And he's talking about sampling rates and bit rate. And he finally gets to dither. And the guy next to me is so confused. He he breaks out in gleeful laugh. Like he's you couldn't get a person more confused than this guy. He just starts laughing out of glee. And uh He's like, what? And he just like starts laughing. And I could tell he was just super confused. But anyway, every time I think of Dither now, I think of that meetup at the Florida Podcast Association when Roy came in and told all these noobs about Dither. They were clueless. Like they were clueless when he talked about condenser and dynamic mic. When he brought up Dither, they were like out of their minds. So it was just, it's just a warm, hilarious moment in my life. Well, it's, it's so true because. Dither is definitely one of those kind of 1% things, you know? Yeah. It's like exactly which digital to audio converter you choose, or it's probably has less of an influence on the sound than moving the mic an inch or two, you know, in front of an right. instrument. Um, right. But because it's confusing and complicated and people don't get it, it's something that I have to spend a huge amount of time talking about. You know, if you told me... <laughs> five or six years ago before I got into the, the kind of the, this whole thing of, of having a, having a blog and, and doing products to help people get better sounds with their music. I would never have believed that I would spend as much time as I have talking about dither. I mean, there's at least three <laughs> blog posts, in-depth blog posts on it that I've, that really? I've done on it. Yeah. So um, you know, and it is, it's, it's just one of those things. My thing is don't dither, just dither. You know, don't worry about whether you should or you shouldn't. Just use the thing and move on. There are so many more important things to be... And and I get attacked. People kind of go, oh, you're going on and on about dither, getting people all upset about something that doesn't really matter. And I'm like, it's not that it doesn't matter. It's just that you just switch it on and forget about it. Um, right. So, and yeah, I can, you know, it's it's a really hard thing to explain, uh, kind of to convey. And yeah, I have every sympathy for, for the guys at the, <laughs> your podcasting convention. <laughs> It was hilarious. But I'm happy to learn it. You know, you get up to a certain point when you want to know those things. Well, it's, so. it's a common question I get. You know, people just keep... I mean, okay, so just very briefly to dispel another myth. Um, one of the things that you hear often is that people say you should only dither once. That is correct, providing you have kept your interim files in a floating point file format. Okay, so we talked before about... Have we talked about floating point processing maybe that's one for another for a later episode all modern DAWs use floating point processing where you don't have to worry if the signal clips unless you're using plugins that emulate analog gear um, and you also get even more than 24-bit resolution for the for the very quiet stuff um, if you stay inside a single DAW or audio processing package or whatever you don't have to dither while you're, you know, while you're feeding things through plugins and moving things around. It's okay to to stick a 32-bit floating point resolution. Whenever you save out as a 24-bit file or 16-bit file, that's when you have to dither, and that's where the confusion comes in because people take that only dither once thing to mean that oh, I don't have to dither it when I save it out as a a 16-bit or a 24-bit uh. file, and then I re-import it and I overdub some other stuff and then I save it out again, or when I play it out of one digital piece of kit through an analog signal chain and back in again, you know, they think it will be done only by the mastering engineer right at the final end of the chain. I mean, it's absolutely crucial that a mastering engineer uses the correct bit depth of dither for whatever he's outputting as a final file format, but you also need to use it prior to that in the chain whenever something gets saved as a 16 or 24 bit file. I see. Um, so yeah, and a, good to know. Anybody listening? It, you, know, you only do the once every time you save it to a file. It's, is that the mastering maxim? Don't dither, just dither. No, this show isn't about dither. This is huh. about this is about distortion. Okay, how many how many people do I need to tell me that I have to do an episode on dither to actually do an episode on dither? I uh, think here come the email. <laughs> I'll do a show on dither if I get twenty emails asking me to do it. 
I haven't done the percentages. That's got to be enough to avoid that. Um, and if that happens, then people have a sneak preview of the dip, the maxim. Um, <laughs> no, the maxim for this week on distortion is make sure you have damn good monitoring. Can you guess why I'm saying that? Yeah, because if the monitors aren't good, you might not be able to hear the distortion that a good monitor will allow you to hear. Exactly. Yeah. The Yes. <laughs> well played, sir. It's your final show. That's it's right. Good to get one right on the That's final right. show. I'm going to miss the dither show, but I'm happy about this. <laughs> you can listen to it. You can you are going to subscribe, aren't you, Steve? Of course. <laughs> leave a five-star review yes that's what we need um the it's exactly that if you have uh, so to take a uh, a really extreme example if you're listening on a mobile phone speaker you know the speaker is what the size of your thumb if you're lucky um right it distorts at about 70 percent of the volume and it carries on distorting i mean it has all kinds of distortions that you wouldn't necessarily think of distortions like it cuts out all of the bass it probably cuts out all the highs but then it also you know just has flat out distortion because people play them too loud and they can't cope um if you were trying to mix on that and decide whether or not well to use another extreme example you were hearing truncation distortion from the dither or not um you haven't got a hope in hell um you don't even have a hope in hell if you're trying to just dis- decide how overdriven a guitar sound should be and the same thing applies to to studio monitors you know clearly nobody uh, i think some people use uh smartphones as for reference you know they listen to their mixes on a smartphone that that makes a certain amount of sense um yeah just to check how it works on a that kind of format but in terms of your main studio monitoring if you've got if, if they kind of have insufficient power handling say in the the amps or the speakers and they're introducing distortion into the signal when there isn't any in the signal itself. When there is some in the signal, it will get masked by the distortion in the speakers, and you won't be able to hear it. Um, I actually did a blog post with a great visual analogy of this using a comparison of normal resolution and high-definition video footage that we can link to. I mean, But just to, cool. to describe it, basically, there is a remastered version of a an old Peter Gabriel gig where they went right back to the original 35mm footage where they do a head-to-head comparison of the Blu-ray versus uh, the original DVD release. And the first time I watched this, I watched the DVD, and I thought, well, actually, that kind of looks better. Um, And that's because it's in this tiny little window. So the fact that the colours and the contrast and the edges are all super enhanced and overcooked actually kind of helps when you're looking at it through this tiny little postage stamp window. But then when you blow that thing up to full screen and allow YouTube to load... The, the high definition 1080p version and yeah. then you see this comparison the you know the full resolution version looks pristine and beautiful um, and the other one is just full of digital hash and noise and blocking artifacts and on all the rest of it exactly the same thing applies in terms of audio if your speakers are capable of reproducing the highest possible quality you will hear every other floor that is within the signal from further down the signal chain so that's i mean it's a paradox that i've mentioned before which is that you know mastering monitoring should be the best monitoring in the chain the better the speakers in some ways the worse the signal sounds the audio sounds because you hear more of the flaws that are embedded in it but what that means is when you're making those decisions that we've been talking about in this show about how much distortion of this to use or whether it's a you know whether the the benefits of the the tube saturation or whatever it else is it is kind of is outweighed by the benefits to the sound or the cost is too great you can only really make those decisions objectively if you can hear the signal really really accurately so the better quality your monitoring is especially in a mastering context the better setup you are to make the right creative choice you know i mean the kind of the theme of this has been well distortion is supposed to be a bad thing but we use it as a creative choice all the way through the chain including at mastering but you have to get the balance right. You know, it's, and that's what's so upsetting about the loudness war is the fact that everything gets distorted just because. That's not a creative choice, you know, that's just kind of painting by numbers as far as I'm concerned. Um, right. You know, right. if Primal Scream or Metallica or whoever want to distort the hell out of whatever they're working on as a creative choice, that's fine, providing they do it 
with full knowledge, providing they do it with their, their eyes open. So yeah, the mastering maxim is make sure your monitoring is good enough that you can accurately hear the effects of the choices that you're making. And this is becoming a new catchphrase. If you make good choices, you'll get a great result. That's awesome. Cool, man. I love it. Great information. Good show. I'm happy to do it. There you go. And it's the last one. Yeah, for me. Don't be alarmed. It's the last one for me. Who knows? I might be back someday. But if I let you in, maybe you will. I'll come on. That's what I'm saying. I was just about to say that. <laughs> but <laughs> if you crawl, if you beg, nah, you'd be welcome back anytime. Thanks, Ian. Well, uh, if you guys want to find out more about the show, read the show notes, you know, listen to the episodes in an embedded player, anything like that, go to themasteringshow.com. Also, you could sign up for our hot list there, which gets you onto our mailing list. And what else should they do, Ian? They should also follow me on Twitter, at Ian Shepard. Uh, they should friend me on Facebook. Uh, just search and you'll find me. They should friend you on Facebook. And they should head over to edmmr.com to see the other podcasts that Steve has been involved with recently. And who knows, maybe involved with again in the very near future. I don't know about very new, but it's definitely in the cards. It's definitely in the cards for the future. I don't want to say I'm having too much fun right now at my job, but I my mind is fully, uh, I don't know, what's the engaged. word? Occupied. Engaged. Yeah. Engaged in with what I'm doing. So uh, when that when that starts to wear off and things are things calm down a little bit, who knows what might happen. Yeah, I mean, that's good. That's that's a good reason to, to take a step back. Um, and what I would say to everybody listening is just head over there, subscribe to all of those podcasts, and then... At some point, if Steve decides to do some more episodes, they will be right there ready, waiting for you to listen to them. Thanks. And I guarantee if you do go over and do that, you'll have enough content to last you probably about a year before you start complaining for more. So, <laughs> I was prolific there for a couple months. Anyway, um, I hope you guys enjoyed this show. Um, I know I have enjoyed it very much, and I'm very thankful for Ian for doing this. I had to talk him into it in the beginning. And I'm glad you did. And... Thank you, Steve, for for persuading me. Like I said, it's uh, there wouldn't be a show without you, and I appreciate that. No problem, Ian. Anytime. All right, guys. Hope you enjoyed the show. Thanks for listening. <laughs>